What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Wednesday. I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and welcome to this week's collection review. Uh, today we're going to be jumping into a pretty serious collection with eight uh, pretty, 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 pretty cool tool watches. Let's do it. All right, um, all right, but before we do, a quick wristwatch check. I right now, I'm fronting. I'm I'm big pimping. I'm wearing a, uh, a Patek Philippe, I reference 5711 uh, Nautilus, one that's obviously been worn, and I love that. Uh, I, I hate to see these these watches that are just so beautiful, that are safe queens. Uh, I mean, I, I get it when you see like a 1518 or a 2499, please show photos of both, or, you know, a, or 3448, and you see them that, yeah, they, you want them kind of, you know, minty. But a watch like this, I mean, it, it's, it's too good not to wear. You know, it's too good not to wear. So anyway, this is not mine. This belongs to a friend, but uh, but I am lucky enough to wear it uh, for the moment. So I'm taking advantage of that moment. So let's get into this. Uh, let's get into this collection review. Okay, so today's collection uh, has been curated by a, uh, a watch geek and a TNH fan, uh, Nick. Uh, Nick has, has has built an eight piece collection, uh, an eight piece collection of, of, of tool watches. I mean, almost exclusively, but there is one uh, German. Probably, I mean, an homage uh, uh, exception, but uh, but I, I really really love it. So so let's let's get into let's get into uh, the first uh, a Seiko a Seiko uh, S N K eight oh five. Yes, I had to read that reference. I do not know Seiko, uh, but I, I've got to say I, I, I'm a little bit of a Seiko hater. Um, that, that's not that's not true. I mean, I, I don't hate Seiko. I, I don't give Seiko very much attention. They're, they're, they were never the watches that I was introduced to early as a collector, so I never got to build my collection on their backs, uh, which so many people have. Uh, and because of that, people have serious admiration for their brand because they were there when you know they were just beginning. And I, I give Seiko enormous props uh, and, and gratitude for being that kind of like hand to help people into this community. Um, but I've got to say, I mean, this is a, this is a terrific looking watch. I mean, this, the, you know, so many, so, so many times I look at modded Seikos, you know, like this one or this one, uh, and I say, wow, that's a really cool looking Seiko. If only they made them look that cool. Uh, and then you look at this and you say, wow, that, that kind of lives up to that. That kind of has that extra level of real, like interesting design. The dial is sectored and split with the hours in the center and the minutes around. Uh, and beyond that, just the color alone is it, this, this army matted green is awesome. I mean, it reminds me of something that you know uh, 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 Alessandro Squarzi would would design. Uh, shout out to my boy Alessandro Squarzi. Not that I know him; he's just the man. Uh, but anyway, I'm a, I'm a huge huge fan of this watch. Uh, I don't know what it means to you, uh, but I've got to say, uh, awesome piece, awesome you know quote unquote beater. The next watch is an Omega Speedmaster, which usually does make an appearance in these collection reviews. Uh, a lot of people, you know, obviously do have this watch for the right reasons. I mean, this is, uh, although my favorite watch, I do not own one. Uh, it's a watch that we all as watch geeks have to just respect, admire, uh, not just for its historical importance, for which it has plenty, uh, but for its, its, its build quality. I mean, this, I believe, has the 1861 movement, which is not a far cry at all uh, from from the original Speedmaster movement. These movements were literally in, in space. Uh, yes, there are other chronographs from other brands that could, could have done the same thing, that could, that could withstand the same uh, uh, pressure and, and, and you know, circumstances, uh, but Omega is the one that did. You know, so it's kind of a moot point. So even when we do look past the historical importance, it always does kind of loop back. But what really caught my attention about this watch, and I actually didn't know this watch existed, uh, it's the 50th anniversary Speedmaster. Uh, so it's got this really cool kind of like logo, this gold and red mixed uh, a logo, which is unseen before on Speedmaster uh, dials. It is the Speedmaster logo, just never been seen before on a dial. Very cool. It, it doesn't change the watch you know, really at all, uh, as far as, you know, what it's built of and all of those things. But, uh, as you do know, in the world of watches, small details, particularly on dials, mean the world. Uh, this watch could theoretically, I don't know, but this watch theoretically could, even if it was mass produced, for which I don't think it was, I think it was limited production, um, but even if it was, right, this watch 
probably stands a better chance at appreciation in the you know 25 30 year game because it has that extra little talking point that, that separates it you know it has an opportunity to be collected as opposed to just being consumed so big props for owning this watch uh, it, it's not you know this enormously rare or enormously valuable watch uh, but it is a, a it is a really really high quality piece with the extra interest and I've got to give you props for that Next is a piece from those bulky Italians over at Panerai. Uh, this is the PAM 1392. Uh, this is actually a watch I hadn't seen before. Uh, I am not a self-proclaimed Panadisti, so I do not, uh, I don't deal in Panerai. Uh, either in, in, you know, my personal kind of, you know, collecting or my personal life or in business. Uh, I totally would, I just don't at the moment. Uh, I, I do admire Panerai for many reasons and in many different ways, but it still is not something that I'm dealing with every day. So being exposed to this watch, having an opportunity to Google a reference that I didn't know existed, uh, really was was you know rewarding. That's kind of where I get my kind of kicks. So uh, I, I do like this Panerai quite a bit. Uh, I've, I've handled plenty, and I've got to say this is probably one of the most aesthetically attractive Panerais uh, that that I've seen. I love this kind of, it's definitely matte, almost gradient dial. I think that the, the blued seconds on the left there <clears throat> are beautiful. Uh, no, they, they, I mean, it doesn't mean anything. They could have just as easily been steel. It's not impressive that they're blue, but it's beautiful. More importantly than any of that, kind of on, on, the, on the other side of the dial, what is impressive is their execution of the date window, which is really visible in your photo. That to me is interesting. Uh, and I, I, th I think that they executed it perfectly. They, they used depth, but they didn't use contrast and color which is something that you usually don't see. You usually see, you know, flat and, and nothing really uh, two, two or three or whatever dimensional, uh, but you do see the color transition, which to me doesn't really always work. But in this instance, I think Panerai knocked it out of the park. Uh, so the blue was a good choice, but the date window was a top quality, uh, I think, design, you know, project. Uh, I don't know how long it took them to do it, uh, but you know what? When no one else is doing something, no matter how long it took you to do it, got to give you props. So, uh, so very, very cool watch. The coolest thing with that watch is sandwich dial. Fully know. sandwiched. Oh, it is, right? Yeah. 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 But their sandwich dials are what drew me to Panerai in the first place. Understand Everything now. has okay. a gap. All right, cool. I get that now. Okay, cool. It's like the layered on top. All right. Well, you learn something new every day. I mean, another thing that I, I didn't mention about what I liked aesthetically about the dial, but I, I really didn't touch upon it uh, at all, not only aesthetically, but in, in kind of like the, the interest and the depth that kind of goes along with the date window. Uh, this is a sandwich dial. What the frig is a sandwich dial? I had no idea. If you take a look at the photo and kind of blow it up, you'll see the indices, 12, 6, and all around, they're not painted or applied, but rather laid beneath the black dial. That's really beautiful. I, I mean, and, and I, once again, I did not even notice that. I guess I brushed over it too quickly, uh, which is a, a rookie mistake. Uh, but that really does make sense now with, with the depth that I was talking about with, with, the, with the date. Huge props, Panerai. Jeez. I, I gotta, gotta give it to you, man. Good, good pick. Good pick. Okay, moving on to the next watch. Something that I've seen in the metal hundreds of times in, in stores but I've never actually seen on the wrist. And, and that means something. I, I go to a lot of watch events. I mean, I, I meet a lot of people with a lot of different watches, and I've actually never been lucky enough to see a Meister Singer, uh, particularly not, not this example, which we'll get into in a second, uh, on the wrist. Uh, it, it, they're famous for this single hand kind of mechanism, uh, which like I said, we'll get into in a second, but uh, it, they've always piqued my interest and I'm really glad that, that, it, that it was brought to my attention in your collection because then I had to dig a little bit deeper. So, uh, so let's do it. Okay, so what better way to kind of take my Meistersinger virginity uh, than with an extremely rare uh, Meistersinger. This is a, a 1 out of a 48, and I'm not sure what number uh, uh, you have, Nick, but the 48 of these watches were produced, uh, and like I mentioned before, they were uh, in commemoration or in, you know, homage uh, to Giambattista Rodella, who is some, someone I never, you know, heard of before. Uh, he was from the 18th century, he was an Italian, uh, famous for, or, you know, I mean, fa famous in certain communities, I never heard of him, so I didn't mean that. I didn't mean like, oh, I only know all famous people, that's not, it's... God. So he's a famous watchmaker, architect, designer uh, that was manufacturing six-hour uh, clocks uh, and, uh, I guess, 
constructing them and putting them on, on, on major buildings, uh, which is very, very cool. I, I, it's quite possible that I've seen one of his clocks in person, and, and I guarantee you from here on out, as the watch geek that I am, uh, I will, next time I'm in Italy, I will be looking uh, for one of his clocks. Uh, so I do hope that they are uh, abundant, uh, because that would be really, really cool to take a photo and send it to you, Nick. But but dialing back into the watch, uh, I 100% do think that Meister Singer paid extreme respect, not necessarily in a, in a creative way, but they shouldn't have necessarily been creative, uh, in a very literal way uh, to Rodella. Uh, this Meistersinger at 43 millimeters is not quite a, a building clock, uh, it's not small either, uh, but it's essentially a smaller version of one of these clocks. It's a one hand, six hour dial, and that one hand goes around four times throughout a day uh, to clear the day. I don't know how you read this. I spent plenty of time online looking at it, and yes, I could figure out times, uh, but I did feel like a kindergarten, you know, kid, uh, saying like, okay, now, you know, Anna, our editor is like, okay, now show me 445, and I'm like, but I, I could do it if you give him a second, you know, it, 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 it's definitely not easy. Uh, so even if you are good at it, uh, I don't necessarily believe you if you tell me that you do it quickly, uh, even if you are good. But, uh, but all in all, very interesting watch. Uh, I gotta say, I appreciate the hell out of your little, like, obscure kind of, you know, taste. I think it's really cool so far. Let's go into the next watch. Boom, a staple, uh, a Zenith El Primero, uh, a watch that, although I am not a sports watch uh, fanatic, I appreciate them immensely as a, as a watch geek, uh, but for my personal taste, I, I usually don't go into sports watches, but damn, if there's one sports watch, one sports chronograph particularly, that has my heart, uh, it probably is the El Primero. In 1969, uh, in the middle, or at the end, I suppose, of a very long and heated race uh, between uh, Zenith, uh, between the developers of the Caliber 11, which I believe uh, was, was Hamilton, right? And Seiko, uh, for the first automatic chronograph, uh, the, the El Primero, you know, El Primero came out. And although they were the first, the, the first, to me, isn't the most important kind of variable here. Being the first in this instance is, is, is very, you know, cool, and it's good to say in retrospect, but first would have meant nothing if the watch was shit. Uh, it just so happens that in 1969, Zenith released one of the best chronograph movements, particularly in its price range of all time. A movement that is that's still not only made, but valued and looked at as probably one of the most uh, important, not only in history, but in price point, movements of all time. People swallow El Primeros because they know what they are. Uh, those who don't aren't that interested. They want they want other watches. You know, they want watches that have a little bit more cachet. Uh, but those who are in the know know that the El Primero, uh, which although is not necessarily new, uh, doesn't really need to be changed all too much. Uh, still, they've added complications. They've added, you know, triple calendars and things like that, and they've done it very well. Uh, but, damn. You know, you have a Meistersinger, a, a bizarro piece that has tied in history very well, is not necessarily a part of history. Then you have something like the Zenith El Primero, uh, which is history, horological history itself. So big props. I'm an enormous fan of this watch. I'm very excited to talk about it, so thank you for making me. Okay, and the last two watches we're going to get through really quick. Uh, one, the Tudor Black Bay Bronze, uh, a watch that... Uh, I do love, I love the usage of alternative materials. That's the biggest thing that I've given props to Hugh Blow for in the past, even though I'm not a Hugh Blow fan. Uh, so I'm a big fan of this watch in that respect. Uh, I do think there are less expensive alternatives that pack just as much punch, like from Oris, uh, but that doesn't make this Tudor, you know, bad. It's still a very, very cool watch, um, and I actually like the strap you paired it with very much so. So, interesting watch, you know, per probably the, the perfect, uh, you know, vacation or, or, or you know, beat up uh, nice watch, or a nice watch that looks like it could get beat up, but you won't beat it up because you spent a lot of money on it. That kind of thing, if you know what I mean. And finally, an Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean, reference 2210.50. Uh, th these references to me are ridiculous. I have no idea what I just said, uh, but I do know the watch. I don't necessarily see the correlation between this watch and Seamaster Legacy, which does bother me, that always has. I wish that these Planet Ocean watches uh, were a different line and a different model. That would make more sense to me, but still, awesome piece. Not only do I think it's a very handsome watch by one of the most well-respected and deservedly so companies of all time, uh, 
but I think that it's a wonderful alternative to the Submariner, a watch that I definitely love and respect, uh, but that doesn't mean that everyone has to have it. You know, there are other watches out there that are wonderful alternatives. I think this is one of those. With that note in mind, Anna, please link below to my video, our video, uh, about the Rolex Submariner, why I think it's the one watch anyone needs. It's kind of a, you know, contrary points, uh, but both points, I think, were made, you know, pretty well. If I may say so myself. One final point on that watch, uh, the coaxial movement uh, is enough to make Rolex the bed. Not sure if they are, but it is enough. Uh, so once again, I've said this basically after all of your watches, but big props. Wait, I forgot the exception. I forgot, I forgot, I forgot the literal tagline that this video was, was built on. Uh, the exception to your tool watch collection. Uh, the Glass Suit Original uh, Peno, Peno Reserve or something like that. Uh, this is one of my favorite watches of all time. Uh, I don't own one, but I absolutely would in a second. Uh, I'm gonna run right through what I think about it and why I think it's so important. Uh, it is an homage and it gets a two in creativity because the design is based basically stolen uh, both like literally in design and in the kind of conception of the watch from Long and Zone. There is no question. Still, the glass suit original is not only executing that stolen conception or, or whatever in a very like just top quality and respectable way. If you look at the movement, if you look at the case, everything is top notch from the prolage and the finishing. You're talking about pretty much so hot horology, but in steel, something that Langa just won't do. And I don't blame them for not doing it, uh, and I'm glad they don't do it, because it gives opportunity for Glass Suit Original to do it. Uh, they can offer this watch somewhere in the, you know, uh, I think you see them on the internet for six, seven, or eight thousand uh, dollars, and at that price point, which isn't that far off from so many Rolexes that are, although definitely iconic, lesser watches without question in, you know, an actual construction, Damn, that's a value prop. Huge props to this watch. I, I, I literally could not enjoy and be passionate about this watch more. Uh, and that's, you know, I'm the vintage guy, but damn, do I appreciate, you know, this modern watch. Okay, now into my recommendation. Okay, so you've got seven watches that are in somewhat of a similar vein. They are either tool watches or they're large. I mean, they're certainly not copies. They don't overlap, but they definitely all complement each other. And then you have the Glasshead Original, which I don't know how you own that and appreciate it, but I couldn't respect you more for having that kind of, you know, uh, diversity there. Uh, but what do I think you know, you would appreciate on top of this collection. Uh, you mentioned a GMT, and I'd hate to agree with you because in agreeing with you, I'm not bringing a new watch to your sites, uh, but I have to agree with you. I really do think you would really love uh, a GMT. I mean, particularly maybe a reference uh, 16750 uh, matte dial if you could find one, uh, but even the, you know, the glossy dials, the white gold uh, indices, they're wonderful watches. To me, my favorite part about them, which you may or may not like, considering you do obviously like more bulky watches, uh, they are slimmer than the more modern GMTs. So if you're looking for a more bulky GMT, go with the reference 16710. Uh, it's not the first one I recommended, but it is the first GMT I ever fell in love with. Uh, it's my dad's GMT, and I can say without question, it wears much more substantially. Um, they're not cheap watches by any means, uh, but I don't think you seem to care too much, uh, you've invested a ton of time and a ton of money into your collection, uh, and you've done it really, really well. So uh, so chew on the GMT, think about it. If I can help you with the search for it, please do let me know. Uh, I'm always just an email away at info at theowenharris.com. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I couldn't have been happier to bring you this collection.